you guys for being here this morning as we go back to the book of Genesis. So uh, we're in Genesis 29. It's, we talked last week about how that was a weird chapter for whatever reason. We, originally when they wrote the Bible, Hebrew, Greek, all the stuff, chapter breaks and all that stuff weren't there. If you look at any old, old manuscripts, it's just line after line after line after line, no breaks. And so the chapter breaks is kind of a new invention supposedly to help it make it easier. But last week it made it harder because there was a break right in the middle of a chapter. So we're looking today at Genesis 29, 31 through chapter 30, verse 24. So if you go ahead and go there, but to remember what we looked at the last couple of weeks so we can pick back up with the context and what's going on. We remember that there was all kinds of turmoil in the house that Jacob had grown up in, that he had been part of a family manipulation. Everybody was scheming against each other, that he found out that his brother wanted to kill him. And so he ran from there kind of at the behest of his mother, ran out into the desert, had this incredible encounter with God where he saw the angels of God descending and ascending back into the heavenlies. God promised him all these wonderful promises, says, I'm going to be with you, bless you, take care of you, bring you back, give you children, use your children to bless the entire earth, all the people groups of the earth, and I'll always provide for you, and I'll always be with you. And so he woke up from this dream, praise God, it's this wonderful time, but we also noticed that he made some foolish choices, kind of made this vow with God, said, if you, then I. And we talked about, made this statement last week that Kent Hughes says, Kent Hughes is one of my favorite teachers, and he said um, that Jacob Man, he's a piece of work, but he's a work in progress. And then we mentioned that it was God who does that work. And I said, how beautiful is that to see that he's a piece of work, but a work in progress, God doing the work, because that reminds us of us. And it should remind you of you. If you are in Christ Jesus, if you're not in Christ Jesus, everybody in this room is a piece of work. All of us. If you don't believe me, just ask the people on the road with you. You are a piece of work. Um, I know for a fact I could ask all of you and you tell me I'm a piece of work. But if you are in Christ Jesus, you are a work in progress. Um, if you're not in Christ Jesus, you're not. You just are what you are, what you've always been. You're not changing. You're just as dead as you were the day you were born. Uh, but if in Christ Jesus, you are a work in progress as well. God is doing that work. Um, and so we knew that he, that he knew this about himself, that he walked boldly into this encounter at the well in the middle of the desert. He knew God was working. He was so excited. He saw this beautiful young lady walk out of Shepherdess, Rachel, that day. He started running his mouth because he's in love and he's nervous like men often do. And she said, wait, got her dad. Her dad came back and said, you won't believe the story I've heard. And Laban, this manipulator, this schemer, because God's going to use him to work on Jacob, says, okay, riches. I can get some money from him just like I did from his daddy. And so he goes and brings him in doesn't see any riches, but he says, oh, you're in my family. You can come and be with me. So he brings him to the house, but Laban, the manipulator, Laban, the schemer, Laban, the businessman, realizes I can make a buck off of this guy. He says, should you live with me for free for no reason? What are your wages? And instantly the Bible draws us back to those daughters that he has. And he's noticed that one pretty one already. And he says, well, I really love Rachel and she's beautiful. I work for seven years. If you will give me Rachel to be my wife. And so Laban says, deal and so he works for seven years and says he loves her so much it seems like days to him. And then after that, there's this big, huge wedding celebration. Everybody knows that Jacob loves Rachel. Rachel's going to marry Jacob. It is a plan of the whole night. The whole party is about Jacob and Rachel being married. But that night, apparently, daddy and daughter Leah had a different plan. Because that night, Laban, instead of sending Rachel in to consummate his marriage with or consummate her marriage with her husband Jacob, he sent in his older daughter Leah. And so this plan that Laban and Leah had, how terrible is that? What, are the, what does that do to Leah? How, do, how could she feel like that? What does that do to Rachel? Jacob wakes up in the morning. We don't know how, how bad off he was, but he wakes up in the morning. He goes, oh, Leah, you're here. You're not Rachel. So he runs outside of the tent and he goes to her dad, Laban, and says, what is this thing you've done? We made this agreement. We made this deal. I worked seven years for Rachel, and here is Leah. And then we see the nastiness of Laban. He says, we don't do it like that in our country. He says, we don't elevate the younger over the older sibling here like you did back home. That was a shot. And Jacob felt that sting. And he said, oh, but I'll make another deal forever. The businessman always thinking about how to make the next dollar. And he says, just finish out the week with the older sister, and then I'll give you the other one for another seven years. And he says, okay. So he finishes out that week with Leah, that marriage week with Leah. And then he works for another seven years. He gets Rachel, consummates that marriage as well. Both of them, the daddy gives over to him two of their slave girls or servant girls that work for them, care for them, watch over them. So Jacob, who just loved Rachel and wanted Rachel, now has four women, two of which are his wives. The other two, we're going to see what happens with them today. One of the major statements we made last week was we reminded ourselves of God's sovereignty. We said at any point God could have said, nope, 
I'm not going to let Laban treat my covenant son Jacob that way. I'm not going to let Laban treat his daughter Rachel that way. I'm not going to let Leah, the sister who may be a little bit less pretty or a little bit less this and that. As a matter of fact, the Bible doesn't really talk about her being ugly. It just says her eyes don't sparkle as much. That's what that means, that she's weak in the eyes. Because her eyes don't sparkle like Rachel's do. And so, so, we, so we're not going to let God could have stopped all this, but he let it go down. Why? Because he's sovereign. He's sovereign, and he chose to work on this, this piece of work, this work in progress. He chose him to go through this horrible situation to chisel away at him, to chisel away things that did not look like God. It was going to be painful. It was going to be long, but it was God's process, and it is God's process about sovereignty. Now, we hear the word sovereign throughout our world. We don't really get that in our, in our nation because we don't have a sovereign. We vote in a person. They're there for a season. We vote them out, or we vote them in again, and then they're out after they turn out. But we don't have a sovereign here where you're just in a position because your name or because your family and you are over all. Now, we have the idea that England thinks they have a sovereign, a sovereign. There's other nations that think they have a sovereign, but that's not sovereign. This is why we only see true sovereignty in God, because here's what sovereign means. Solely in control. Nobody else is in control. That they stand apart and high above all other people. They're nothing like the people they watch over. <laughs> They're different than them. They're way better, far different from them. And they always get their way. Their will will be accomplished. And nothing can stop that. Now, the Queen of England can make laws. She can make rules. She can say things. But she can't make people obey. She can't make sure that in every household, in every mind, in every thought, in every corner, in every dark spot, that things are happening exactly the way that she had planned. She's not a sovereign. God is the only true sovereign. And so in his sovereignty, he allowed all of this to go down. Now, God in his sovereignty does not excuse rebellion, treason, or sin. But even in these, he will accomplish his purpose. What else has he got to work with? He doesn't have any perfect building blocks. And so he doesn't excuse the sin of our hearts or our rebellion or our treason, but he works with them to accomplish his purpose. And what is his purpose before we get into today? So we know that one of his purposes for right now is to bring about the promised redeemer that we talked about way back in Genesis 3. He said that one day one will come who will crush the head of the serpent. So that was a promise. And so that's part of his will that's coming into fruition. We see a gigantic step coming in these next couple chapters. But then another promise right now is he's going to give offspring to a childless man. And that those offspring will be a blessing to all people groups and they'll be like the dust of the earth. So remember that today as we read this crazy story. And it is crazy. It is insane. But those are the purposes that God is going to bring about. He's going to use things that look weird to us, that look dirty, that look nasty, and they are nasty to us. So let's read Genesis 29 through 30, 29, 31 through 30, 24, and then let's look at what God has to say. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated or unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, affliction for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he's given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore his name is called Levi. She conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. And then she ceased bearing. Chapter 30. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I'll die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel and said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? And then she said, Here, here's my servant Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf, so that even I may have a child through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God has judged me, has heard my voice, and given me a son. So she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and I prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, Good fortune has come. And so she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son, and Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy, and so she called his name Asher. In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went out and he found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. 
But Leah said in return, Is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? Would you also take away my son's mandrakes? And Rachel said, That he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again. She bore Jacob a sixth son. And then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. And after that, she bore a daughter. She called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, May the Lord add to me another son. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. God, we look at these people and we think, how disgusting are they? How sinful are they? How crooked, how corrupt, how manipulating, how scheming. But while their ways may be a little bit different than ours, we are no less scheming, manipulative, evil, or corrupt. And so, Father, I pray that you would take the lessons of people that you've dealt with and you would deal with people today, me included. I pray today, Father, that you would speak to us, that you would give us ears to hear, and that you would open our eyes and let us behold great and wondrous truths from your scripture. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 2931, without mistake and intentionally, as God does all things, it opens with a statement of God's sovereignty. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated or unloved, he opened her womb, her womb, but Rachel was barren. God saw and God responded because God alone had the power to do this. No other person can bring about a child. No other person can open or close a womb. In our day, we've cheapened this to just biological works. It's not that. The Word of God makes it clear that every child is a gift from above. Every child. In every nation, every land, every tribe, every tongue, they're all a gift from above. All of them. God works in all of them. This is a statement of sovereignty. God is the one who opens the womb of Leah. Why? He says that he saw that she was unloved, but also because he chose to. Why was Rachel's, barren, why was Rachel's womb barren at this point? God doesn't tell us that, but because he chose to do so. I understand that there's pain and other things that go on with this, but God does things that we don't understand, and it's not our right to understand. We think that we have the right to understand everything, but we do not. So we see a statement of God's sovereignty. He saw, he responded, God opened one womb, he kept the other closed for this time. I want to make two other statements as well. First, a statement on Jacob and his philandering. Jacob is, in fact, a piece of work, but a work in progress. He looks like a scoundrel. Because he is one. He is one. Don't whitewash this. It doesn't mention Jacob's name every single time. But don't miss the fact that she bore once, then bore again, then bore again, then bore again. That doesn't happen through one occurrence. My sons are here. It happens through multiple occurrences. And then to a servant girl, and she has two children, multiple occurrences. Almost like as if he's skipping beds, one after the other, one after the other. Because he is. He is a scoundrel. He's a piece of work, but a work in progress. But so is every other person in this story. And so is every person in this room. And that should be encouraging, not attacking towards us, because this makes the lessons here personal to us. If we're honest with ourselves and say, you know what, I am a piece of work, but I am a work in progress if I'm in Christ Jesus. God, what do you have to say to me today? What do you want to say to me? I know. John, put the baby down. Put the baby down. We are all pieces of work, but a work in progress. The next thing I want us to say is the context about women in that day. I'd love to tell you that women were treated with respect the way that we're building towards treating women with respect today, but they were not. They were possessions, they were owned. You see that clearly through this story. Their value was children. And even in that day, be, even in this day, be careful. Pregnant people. Now, women had the gift of giving children, of birthing children. 
But if you could not have children, if you were infertile or other, some other reason for not being able to have babies in this day, or to give an heir, specifically a son, there was great disgrace or shame. You've got to know those things going in. So it opens with a statement of sovereignty. Then verses 32 to 35, we learn a lot from Leah and her sons. Remember it says that Leah came and that she conceived and bore a son and called him Reuben. She had another son and called him Simeon, had another son, called him Levi, and then a fourth son, and she called him Judah. All those names mean something. So we learn something from Leah and her son's name. We learn much about God from Leah's recognitions that she then gives to her sons in their names. The first thing that we see is that God alone is in total control. Three out of the four sons, she says it. Because God has, because God has, because God has, she's not fooled. So often we think of people in the olden days, people in the Bibles, we think there were cavemen walking around clubbing women on the head. No. We think that they were completely unscientific and they didn't understand how things work. No. They understood how things work. Just a basic reading of the Bible shows you that they're not idiots. They get it. They get it. And maybe even more than us sometimes because she understands that this is a work of God. And so she understands that we can learn from Leah and her recognitions and from her son's names that God is totally in control. There is nothing outside of his control. The next thing that we see that we can learn from Leah, her recognitions and her son's names is he's a God who sees. Because the Lord has looked and seen my affliction, he's given me this son. And so I'll name him Reuben. We have a God who sees. He sees every corner, every angle, every situation. We have these silly statements in our word. There's two sides to every story. That is so not true. God sees the truth. Everything else is a lie. We have a God who sees. We also learn from God through the recognition of Leah right here. She says, because God has heard that I am unloved, we have a God who hears. <coughs> and not only does he hear the things that come from our lips and hear the sounds of this earth and the groanings of this earth, waiting for those final days, he hears the thoughts of your mind and the beatings of your heart and the meditations that, you have, that, that go on inside of you. Those things that you may not even know that are there, God hears them. We can't hide from him. This sets him apart from every false god, every idol, every deity. He sees, he hears, he is God. It's what makes him sovereign. So God alone is in total control. He sees, he hears. And then lastly, we see that he is praiseworthy. And we see this by the transaction that we see with each and every son that she gives birth to in this first little transaction. The first one, God sees me. He sees what I'm going through. And, and I'll give birth. His name is Reuben. Maybe now my husband will love me. Next, son. God has heard that I'm unloved, and maybe now in his name is going to be Simeon, and, and, and maybe now God, maybe now my husband will love me, a little less love, but he'll still love me. The next one, I've given my husband three sons. Maybe now he'll be attached to me. I've given up on love. I've given up on love. He's not going to love me, but at least he'll be around. At least he won't go anywhere. But then in that fourth son, there's no mention of her husband. God is worth praising. Praise be to God who's given me my fourth son. Name him Judah. You notice how her desires for earthly things and earthly relationships as those decline, praise increases. That's what we can learn about God. As our desires for earthly things and earthly relationships as those decrease, praise increases for God. It must be that way. Am I telling you not to love your spouse, not to love your children? No. So often we try to say this thing that when the, the Ten Commandments say, you shall have no other gods besides me, we try to say, well, God wants to be first in your life. Nope. God does not want to be first in your life because that puts God in the same stack as other people. First, second, third, fourth. God says, I want to be holy other. You can, you can, you can stack all those up as you want, but I want my whole own category. I am God. That's why I've always told husbands and sons and daughters, love from the overflow. The more you love God, the better husband you will be, and you will love your wife better. The more you love the Lord with your whole heart, strength, soul, and mind, the better you will love your husband, your children. He is holy other. 
We see here from Leah and her sons that God alone is in total control. He sees, he hears, he is praiseworthy. And we praise God rightly and only rightly when other things matter less. Verses 1 through 8 of chapter 30, we see the fruits of lacking the correct focus. Let me read you the first verse, and then I have two questions for you. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. And she said to Jacob, give me kids or I'll die. What or who is her focus or focuses? There's a couple. Self. Herself. Her sister. Her children or wanted children. And Jacob. She's thinking about Jacob. She's like, if I could give him kids and maybe all this. Herself, her sister, the children, her husband. Who is not her focus? What is not her focus? Who is not her focus? Not there at all. So we see today the fruits of lacking correct focus and the right focus is always and only God. If we see and look at our children or our spouse or our jobs and our focus is not God in them, we do them wrong. Do all things is unto the Lord. I'm doing the best I can raising my kids is not good enough. It's not good enough. I'm seeking to worship and praise and honor the Lord by the way I raise my children. God is the focus. And only then is it pleasing to God. And only then will it be done right. I'm going to my job to make a paycheck so I can pay the bills and put food on the table and provide a home and get clothes. No. You're going to your job because God gave you a certain amount of skills and gifts. And you're going to do all things as under the Lord. And that may be preaching a message or building a bridge or caring for people during COVID and outside of COVID. It may be serving hot fries through the window. But you do that for the glory of God. And that's when it's done right. Fruits of lacking the correct focus, God being the only right focus, are this. The first one, verse 1, is we ascribe to men what God alone has. Notice she comes to her husband, Jacob, says, Give me children or I'll die. Jacob doesn't have that ability. He doesn't have that ability. She's ascribing power to Jacob. Jacob, you give me life. You put a baby inside my womb. You create life, knit it together in my womb, and watch over it all the days of its life. Jacob, you got that power. No. When our focus is wrong, we ascribe to men what belongs to God alone. And it's easy for us to think like, oh, that's just these Neanderthals thousands of years ago. But nope. Nope. Listens to the murmurings that come out of our mouths in this day. In this day. Oh, man. If just the right person was there, we could finally be free again. We could get our freedoms back. Galatians 5.1. For you have been freed for freedom's sake through Christ Jesus. You've been given freedom. To ascribe the ability for freedom to be given or taken to you, to a man, is not right. That means your focus is off. If only the right person was there, only the right thing took place by this man, by that woman, I'd have peace. Jesus said, of my peace I leave with you, not as the world leaves with you peace, but my peace I give. We ascribe this to men all the time. If only the right person was there, I'd feel safe again. Protection. Nope. God is the one who protects and watches over. If only the right person were there, we'd have a future country and things would be okay and everything would be all right. We'd have hope and there'd be a provision. Everybody's favorite verse in Jeremiah. See how we ascribe these things in our day to men which belong to God alone? You want to know why? Because our focus is off. These are fruits of people with a bad focus. And all of us need to check ourselves. So when we find our lips murmuring and ascribing to people what belongs to God, correct your focus and repent. And it happens to all of us daily. Daily. The second fruit that we see here from losing our focus is verses 2 and 3, the inability to learn from others. It says that his anger is kindled against his wife and he says, am I God? Do I have the ability to give you a child? Can I do this? Are you asking for me the power that God alone has? But her focus is off, and she has the inability to learn from others or to hear a rebuke and a correction. Because she goes right on with this really ridiculous plan. She doesn't check up and say, you know what, you're right. Can we pray? Can we pray? No, she just continues right on in folly and foolishness. She cannot hear correction. She cannot hear rebuke. Her focus is off. If we cannot hear rebuke, we cannot hear correction, then our focus is off. It's on something else. 
Well, an inability to learn from others. She also doesn't learn from the failures and successes of previous people, nor does Jacob. Think back to Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. It is literally the same exact verbiage. Take my servant girl, sleep with her, give me a child through her, then I can be a mom. They didn't learn from it. And they knew the stories. Remember, Jacob had run his mouth. He told about all this stuff. Incorrect focus makes in us a fruit of an inability to learn from other people. Verses 3 through 5, incorrect focus at not being on God treats us, teaches us, and has a fruit of abuse and mistreatment of other people. Take my servant girl, Bilhah. Sleep with her. Give me a kid through her. Can you imagine this abuse, this mistreatment? That's not what Bilhah was there for. She was a servant girl there to make sure that, that Rachel was bathed, make sure that her meals were prepared, that her clothes were taken care of, maybe to do some house cleaning. But here she's taken out of whatever dreams and hopes and aspirations that she may have had and said, here, you're now married to this man. And not only are you married to him, it's your job to consummate with him. And when you consummate with him, you have to be at his beck and call whenever because you're his wife now. And oh, by the way, if you have any kids, they're mine. Total abuse, total mistreatment. And this is a fruit of an incorrect focus. If we find ourselves abusing and mistreating other people, it's because our focus is off. And then verses 6 through 8, we see flippant usages of God. Look at what she says here in verse 6. She says, God has judged me. He heard my voice. He gave me a son. But then just next son, I've been wrestling with my sister, and I win. She's not concerned with God. She doesn't care anything about God. She just wants to win the battle. She's in a birth war right here with her sister. So incorrect focus leads to a flippant usage of God. We throw his name out there for token things and token praises, but we don't mean it. He's just another stepping stone to get to where we want and what we want. So the fruits of an incorrect focus, ascribing to men what God alone has, an inability to learn and hear from other people, abuse and mistreating other people, and using God's name in vain. If you want to know what it means, it means that. It does not just mean that one little word that none of us say anymore unless we're alone. But it means using God's name and saying, oh God, please do this thing when you're never even thinking about him. You're just thinking about the focus and the dreams and desires that you have. God's name, anything less than worship is using it in vain. Anything else, than, anything less than recognizing him as God is using his name in vain. And these are the fruits of lacking, incorrect, or lacking correct focus. Verses 9 through 13, we also see the fruits of losing our contentment in Lord. Back to Leah. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant, Zophah, gave to her Jacob as a wife, and Leah's servant, Zophah, bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, Good fortune has come to me. So she called his name Gad, and Leah's servant, Zophah, had another son, and she said, I'm happy. Women call me happy. So his son, this son is called Asher, fruits of losing our contentment in the Lord. Because remember, the last time we saw Leah, she's there with Judah, not worried about her husband, not worried about anything. She says, Praise God. Your name is Judah, which comes from the word praise. So the fruits of losing contentment in the Lord, praise stops. Worship ceases. It's not there anymore. It's not there. And don't think for a minute that praise and worship are just activities. Now we've done that in our day. We said, oh, it's, it's time to worship. It's time to praise because the piano is playing or the guitar is playing. Or, it's time for praise time, everybody. No. Praise time is a hard attitude. Worship is a hard attitude. And so the fruits of losing contentment in the Lord is that praise stops. Worship ceases. We also see, again, a fruit of losing contentment in the same way that fruit of losing focus is misuse and abuse of people. Here, you take my servant girl, Zilpah. Make her your wife. Sleep with her whenever you want. Oh, by the way, if she's got any kids, they're mine. They're mine. No concern about Zilpah, her wishes. None of that whatsoever. And notice that this continues to happen over and over and over. And if you wonder, why does Jesus say that people will know we're his disciples by the way we love each other? Because the world doesn't have a correct focus. They're not focused on Jesus at all. They're only focused on the lesser things they're going to burn up one day. 
It's the world, those not redeemed by Jesus. The world has no contentment in God because they either don't know him, don't think he exists, or don't care anything about him. And that is a majority of people on the planet according to the word of God. And so they treat each other as stepping stones. But Jesus said, they will know you're my disciples by the way you love each other. It sets us apart. The way we love each other sets us apart in a world that is not content and not focused on God. And when we are set apart, we are then to shadow, to image the glory of Jesus and lift Jesus up. Because he says, where I am high and lifted up, I will draw people to myself. This is why we are different. It must be different. So the fruits of losing contentment in the Lord, worship stops, praise stops, we misuse and abuse people. We also see a misguided sense of a fortune or things of worth. It says here that she says uh, in the ESV, which is the version I read, or maybe you read the NIV, it says that God has brought me good fortune. Now, it's interesting The King James uses a different one. It says the troops cometh. The troops cometh. And that's an interesting way to say that. But what it's saying here, and they're the same exact thing, is multitudes I've got more, I've got much, I've got lots of stuff, lots of kids. I've got good fortune because all kinds of stuff is piling up on me. A misguided sense of things that matter. When you lose contentment in God, you worry more about the multitude of things, the multitude of stuff. You're not content with God anymore. You're not content with him. Another fruit that we see is we're consumed with being happy or comfortable rather than being right with God. She has another son. She says, I'm happy. How does she know she's happy? Because other women tell her she's happy. I'm happy because they told me I'm happy. Other women have told me so. So I'm going to name you Asher. It's a great name. But the idea is wrong. Losing contentment in God leads us to be consumed with being happy and comfortable or accepting the words of other people rather than being right with God. Think of what she's doing right here. She's abusing people that God created in his image that he loves. That he, he's creating all of this so that they might come to know him in covenant relationships. She's abusing them and says, I'm happy about it. I'm okay with it. I'm comfortable with it. But losing contentment in God, praise, worship stops. We misuse and abuse people. We have a misguided sense of what really matters and what's of value. And we're consumed with stuff. We're consumed with happy. We're consumed with what other people say. And we're consumed with comfort. And then it just goes into a downward spiral through verses 14 through 21. Verses 14 through 21. You remember the rest of this story? It says after this all kinds of crazy things happen and lots of more babies. But I wrote this little note and I'm going to read some of these notes because I don't want to forget what I wrote in the moments of quiet. It says the downward spiral occurs when, when focus is moved from God and contentment in God is no more. Praise and worship has ceased and our desires, our wants are escalated to our king, master, and controller. That's when the downward spiral starts. And so the first thing that we see here in the downward spiral in this one is that crazy situation with mandrakes. With mandrakes. You are given to the superstition and the ways of men. Okay, and I'm going to say this. If there's anybody in this room that's around the age of 40, 45, or anywhere lower than that, when I said mandrakes, I know where your mind probably went. And you're not wrong. Because it's hip-hop culture, too. There's this whole book set in this movie series called Harry Potter, and there's these kids that go in and rip this thing out of the ground. It's a mandrake. But you want to know what's true? Is mandrakes really do look like babies. They really do. That's not just a book. That's not just a movie. It's true. Throughout history, yeah, look it up on your phone. Throughout history, mandrakes have been called love apples. They've been believed to be called, believed to be aphrodisiacs. They've been believed to be fertility, infertility medications. This is why in Song, Song of Songs, in chapter 7, verse 13, the woman there crying out to her lover says, The mandrakes are here. Smell them up. Come to be my lover. This is, this is believed throughout history that mandrakes have this appear, this love apples, this superstition, the ways of men. It obviously doesn't work because Rachel gets them and doesn't get pregnant. And so the downward spiral, when focus of God is moved, contentment is gone, worship is ceased, our wants, our desires have escalated to king and lord and master, is that we're given to the ways of men and given to superstition. Verse 15, man, this one hurts. Verse 15, continuing in the downward spiral, we see a total whitewash of sin and extreme cruelty to other people. Listen to Leah's 
words. Rachel comes to Leah, says that Reuben goes out into the field at the time of harvest for wheat, and he finds some mandrakes there. And Rachel comes, and she, he runs back to, Mom, Mom, I found mandrakes. Now, isn't that sad that the little boy knows what's going on with the war between the sisters? He goes, Mom, look what I found. I found love apples. You can, you can, you can get ahead. You can win. You can win. And he says, Rachel hears about this. Of course she did, because that's what people are doing. They're bragging. We found mandrakes up here. And so Rachel goes in and says, can I have some of those mandrakes? Can I have some of your son's mandrakes? And listen in verse 15, how we see this downward spiral, this total whitewash of sin and great cruelty to others. Leah says this, is it such a small matter that first you stole my husband and now you're going to steal my little boy's mandrakes? Can you imagine that? For seven years, Rachel and Jacob had waited to be married. On her wedding night, when everybody there is celebrating the union of Rachel and Jacob, even Leah, even Laban are putting on front. But when the wine is consumed to max capacity, apparently, and the night dwindles away, and Jacob goes into his tent waiting to consummate with the marriage with the woman that he loves, Leah sides with the evil plans of her daddy and says, hide Rachel. And she has the nerve to come back now and say, is it not enough that you stole my husband? What hurtful words, what incredible cruelty, what whitewashing of sin. Such whitewashing. And this is the downward spiral when all those things happen, when we cease to be amazed with God, not content with him, not focused, not worship, but our wants and our desires and our traditions are what rule over us. Verses 15 through 16, we see the deepest sense of mistreatment of others. We use others only, they're only worth selling and buying and getting what we want. They become stepping stones to get us to a goal. So Rachel goes in and says, hey, can I, can I have some of your mandrakes? And she says, is it not enough that you stole my husband first and now you're going to steal my son's mandrakes? And then Rachel says, so rather than get offended or get her feelings hurt, she goes, oh, well, I'll sell you my husband. I'll prostitute him out to you. Give me some of your roots and then you can have him. And Leah says, okay. Here's some mandrakes. The downward spiral when God is not focused or we're not content in him as we see the deepest sense of mistreating other people as we use them to get only what we want and nothing else. This is her husband. This is both of their husbands. Whether we like it or not, it is what it is. And they trade him for some roots. I bought you with some mandrakes. You have to sleep with me tonight. Just callous. No concern for people. I want us to notice the next thing in this downward spiral that's crazy to me. Notice that mention of God is not absent. He's there. And he continues to be on these people's lips. God has heard me. God has endowed me. God has blessed me. God has given me another child. In the middle of this downward spiral where God is not focused, they are not content with God, they are not concerned with God, they are not worshiping God, their desires, their wants, their traditions, their hopes, their king, master, and lord over their lives, they continue to mention God. God is on their lips quite frequently. He speaks their, they speak his name quite frequently. He's there. They just don't recognize him or respect him rightly. There is no worship. It's only lip service. It is empty religion. An empty religion culminates in what we see in verse 18. We ascribe to God the wrong things. Look at verse 18. God has given me my wages, my children, something I earned. God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. Can you imagine ascribing that evil to God? God, you blessed me with kids because I deserve them and also because I abused, robbed, stole, and put this other woman in a sexual relationship that she didn't want to be in. That's what happens in this downward spiral. As we not focused on God, not content with God, not worried about God, we're not worshiping God. We only care about what we want, how we want it, how we've always done it. We want it now. And so we give in to superstition in the ways of men. We whitewash our sins. We are extremely cruel to other people. We only use people to get what we want. We continue to mention God, but it's just empty. It's false. It's fake. It's fraudulent. And it's disgusting in his sight. And we attribute things to him which are evil. And then verses 19 through 21, 
you notice at the bottom of this downward spiral, there's a complete focus on ourselves, our wants, and beating out others. Leah conceives again. She gets a sixth son. God has given me this. He's given me a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me, focused on other people, because I've given him six sons. And then she has a daughter named her Dinah. Dinah is an interesting name. Hebrew names have a meaning. Dinah means this. I have been judged and vindicated and win. This is a declaration of victory. I had a little girl. Her name is I win. I got all these kids, Rachel, and husband's getting old. We're getting old. You're not going to catch up. I win this war. I win this battle. She's not focused on God. She's not focused on... She's only focused on herself, focused on other people, focused on her wants, focused on beating other people, winning the battle. You know what this is called? Idolatry. Idolatry. And God abhors it. He hates it. He condemns it. And one day he will destroy it and all who are partakers in it. Idolatry. That's the end of the downward spiral. And then at the end of this passage, we see a glimpse of how things should be. No, I'm not telling you that Rachel's in the right place because it doesn't tell us where Rachel is. It doesn't tell us the thoughts of her mind or the feelings that she's feeling. We don't get to know any of that. And you want to know that? That's okay because God's God and he knows what he's doing. And he decides, I'll tell you what I want to tell you. But verses 22 through 24, after seeing this downward spiral that's occurred because of not worshiping God, not being content, not focused on him, only being consumed with our wants and desires, we see a glimpse of how it should be. God remembers Rachel. God listens to her, opens her womb. She conceives and bears a son and says, God has taken away my reproach or my shame or my disgrace. You can say any of that in your Bible. And she called his name Joseph. And she said, Lord, give me another son too. We get a glimpse of how things should be. The first one, recognition of God's soul sovereignty. God has done something. Not Jacob and his arrival, not the mandrakes, not the plans, not my scheming, not, not watching my cycle, making sure that it's this week in the middle of this week and that all things work out. Nope. God. God. God has done something. A sign of how things should be, a glimpse of how, glimpse of how it should be, recognition of God's soul sovereignty. How it should be. The next is a recognition of God who sees, hears, and knows. God knows where she's at. God, you heard my cries and you answered. This is why I love Jonah chapter 2. Because he's a God who hears our cries, sees our disgrace, sees our plight, and he responds. Recognition of God's soul ability, soul sovereignty, that he alone is sovereign. As a matter of fact, if someone is sovereign, there's only one of them can't have multiple sovereigns there is one sovereign lord god's soul sovereignty recognition that he is a sovereign who sees hears and knows and then also that recognition that he alone removes our disgrace our reproach our shame not our works not our striving not the works of another rachel could have said all kinds of things right here she could have like man we've been trying and trying and trying finally baby Nope. She could have said the mandrakes. I, I got those mandrakes and it must have been a good crop because they work, baby. Nope. Jacob just Jacob must have been eating right and drinking more water and taking care of his body because now it works, baby. Nope. None of those things we bought into in our world. God can do this alone. Only God. He alone is sovereign. He sees. He hears. He knows. He has taken away my disgrace. He has taken away my shame. And then lastly, in response to right recognitions, she lets her request be known to God alone. God, thank you for this son. Give me another one. Give me another one. And he does in time. Benjamin arrives. So in right recognition, what is always present in a glimpse of what should be? Prayer. Prayer. No, it may annoy you that I mention prayer so often or talk so often about praying out loud. Matter of fact, I do know that it annoys a lot of you. You mean, if I don't pray out loud and I don't do this? And my response will always be the same. I hear a lot of very vocal voices that speak out loud about ungodly things. 
So you're not afraid to speak publicly, which means you're not afraid, you're just not praying. Those who recognize God rightly, recognize that he alone is sovereign, that he sees, hears, knows, that recognize that he removes our disgrace and that he alone can do that, will pray. Do I need you to pray out loud to make you a prayer? No. But you need to be willing to say, God, do you want me to say something? Are you a person of prayer is what it boils down to. Are you a person of prayer? I don't mean those toss-up firework prayers every 10 years when you're in trouble. Cars on the highway stop way too fast. You know, oh, God, help! No, not that. That doesn't make you a person of prayer. God, it's hot. Would you give me a parking spot in front of the grocery store, a really close one? God, thank you for that parking spot. No, if that's the prayer you prayed last week, you're not a person of prayer. A person of prayer talks to God, hears from God, speaks with God. Again, I want to read what I wrote in a quiet time because I want you to hear in right recognition of God, we respond with speaking to God, praying and listening back. A lack of prayer shows a lack of right recognition. A lack of right recognition of God removes the possibility of worship. We must recognize God rightly before we worship him. If you don't recognize God, you will not pray. And if you don't recognize God and pray, you are not a worshiper. You probably don't know him. You probably don't know him. Or you're not known by him. Show me a worshipful person and they will be a person of prayer. The opposite is also true. If you're not a person of prayer, you are not a person of worship. A person that does not pray does not recognize God rightly and therefore does not worship him. The same rules apply to the gatherings of people. We call it the church. A church that does not pray is not worshiping. They're just burning time, playing a game and pretending. This is why Jesus said my house should be called house of prayer because he understood that prayers understand that they have no power no ability and they're recognizing that god alone does does this define you as an individual and if it defines us as individuals when we come together as a congregation it will define us as a congregation but sadly it doesn't and so because it doesn't really define us as a congregation, I can only go backwards here and say that it probably doesn't define us as individuals. And again, you may be thinking, man, that's judgmental to say. That's rude and hurtful to say from that pulpit. How dare you say that to me, speaking down for me from up above? I'm not saying it to you. The Word of God does. And so your argument is not with me. You're welcome to email or get mad or to gossip about me. But it's in here. This is your argument. Deal with it. In closing, there's two things that stand out that we need to take home today. The first one comes from this. Remember, in our story, we've got abused servants, jealous and unloved sisters, unloving sisters, a scoundrel of a man and an abundance of sin, and none of it can thwart the ways and the will of God. Think about all the good that came through this craziness. The 12 tribes of Israel, which God is quite fond of, came this. The priestly line that came through this fiasco comes from the third son, Levi, and he is going to point to Jesus one day and he is now becoming our great high priest. All that came from this fiasco. The kingly line that came from this mess, Leah's fourth son, Judah, comes from this. This is the lineage of which Jesus comes because he is our once true and final king. All of the good comes from this nastiness. The blessing of the Gentiles and all people groups was birthed in this mess. Remember, God does not excuse nor overlook sin. He hates it. He sent his son in order to die for it and defeat the curse of it. But here's your take home number one. God is completely sovereign. He is immeasurably powerful. And his will cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. It will be. And one day he said that all things, heaven and earth, will burn away. And the things that will remain will be his word and those in relationship with him through his son. And that's his will and that's his plan. And if you are outside of that relationship with him through his son, that means you are one of those that burn. You are one of those that burn and his will cannot be stopped. And those are not words to toy with. Second thing to take home. Remember, 
a loss of focus on God, discontent with having him alone, seeking men for blessings, misguided view of what matters, mistreating other people, whitewashing sins, inability to learn from others, buying into the systems and the ways and traditions of men, driven by our emotions rather than being right with God, God receiving not our praise, not our prayers, not our dependence, but just lip service and our deep-seated desire to declare we're victorious. Now, you may have think I just went back over the whole entire story, and I did. But also, take home lesson number two. It stings a bit. This has been and is currently the state of the American Evangelical Church. And it's been that way since her inception. It's been that way for since her inception. Since the inception, we came here for the freedom of worship. We came here to build ourselves a new home, but don't get it skewed. We also came here for prosperity. And we got that freedom of worship, but we also got that prosperity. And then we married the two. And this became the state of the American Evangelical Church. And nothing has changed. And I'm sure that in a group like this and in a church like this, there's somebody thinking it wasn't like that in my generation. And you would be wrong. You would be wrong. We don't have to spend time going back through God in the 50s. There was a whole group of people that were mistreated and abused and only used for certain things to get our wants and our needs by people who declared that they were Jesus followers. Nope. All of these fruits, the state of the evangelical church is not good. It has not been good in a very, very long time since before any of us were born or American. Isn't that long enough? Isn't it time that we admit that what goes on in the churches, this church, all churches in this land, is not pleasing to God? Isn't it time? Isn't it time to repent and cry out and beg him to forgiveness? Say, God, you gave us this wonderful gift of new life. You created this thing called the church and said you're, she's your beloved. And you gave us commands on how to steer this thing and walk it out. God, forgive us for what we've done. It's nothing but a grown-up playground. We bring our rules, our ball, and if we don't like it, we take it and go to another one. And it is time. It's always been time. Aren't you weary of the game? God is. I would rather you be hot or cold. But since you're neither, since you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus, he's tired of the game. And if we are in Christ Jesus, we should be tired and hate the game as well. Let us repent, cry out for forgiveness, and do the things he commanded us to do, and hate the things that he hates. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for my friends. And here's how I know they're friends. Because I care about them enough to say something hard. But if they weren't friends, if I didn't care, I would just let, just let us wander off into eternity with never saying the word. But God, if you called me your friend and you call us your friends and you tell us things that sting, every time we look in your word it stings. If that's the way you treat me, then how are we to treat each other? And so Father, revive us. And even for some of us, awaken us. God, well, there are some in this room that are so steep in the way things it's always been that they've never met Jesus. They just met the system around him. And so God, whether it's awakening or reviving, only you know. So have your way and do your work. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The last hymn today is hymn number 580. We are called to be God's people.
Man, one of my favorite things is to know that Marilyn prays and asks God, God, which hymn for the day? And she picks a hymn, and I preach a message that God lays in my heart, and then they come together in this beautiful, magical sandwich. So thank you for listening to the Lord and choosing that song, because it was the sermon all over again. All over again. Carol prayed at the beginning of service. She prayed for the soldiers going back into Afghanistan because of all that's going on there now. Last night as I watched over a lot of those soldiers and I watched the news going back to those soldiers, CNN somehow got an interview, interview with a Mujahideen. Mujahideen is just a holy warrior for Islam. Someone who's dedicated their life to the spreading of Islam and Islamic rule, Islamic law, the message of Islam. And this is what that Mujahideen, that Islamic soldier said. Jihad or holy armor, holy army. Jihad does not end until all is accomplished. Well, I'm no Mujahideen and neither are you. Amen. And we are not in jihad. But if you are in Christ Jesus, you are a holy warrior. And it does not end until all is accomplished. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the powers and principalities of this world. And the way we wrestle is prayer and declaring the gospel. You're going to walk into a fight when you leave these doors today. Be faithful soldiers. Father, I thank you for my friends. Help us. Overflow us with your spirit. God, we are people whose cups do overflow. Help us to recognize that, that we might react faithfully for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.